So yeah, once again, thank you for joining us today. And a great day to start off the new year, great way to start off the new year, particularly as we launch this new series called You Are Not Alone. For those of you who are just joining now, my name is David Oakley. I'm the senior pastor here at West Road and Wesley Community Church. And it's my privilege to lead us off and launch this new series inspired by Max Lozado's book of the same title, You're Not Alone. Because everything at the moment screams that we are on our own, isn't it? We've even just had the whole Brexit deal as a country. We can feel like we're on our own. We've been isolated now from Europe, even though there's new trade agreements, we can still feel alone. Our governments, our communities, because of all the restrictions in place, we feel alone. I don't know if you felt that way over Christmas. All our plans as a family were just blown out the water. We weren't able to visit with grandparents and parents. We weren't able to connect with our extended family. So that sense of being alone really hit us. And so we just thought it'd be really appropriate to launch this new year by saying, you are not alone. There is a power of the presence of God with you that you can enjoy and you can make a difference as a result. And in particular today, we're thinking about that sense of the presence of God just in the ordinary things of life. So often we reduce God to the big and the spectacular, and of course God does that, but also he's there in the ordinary, working out his plans and his purposes. So to get our minds working around what we're going to chat about this morning, a uh, question to get you started. What's the biggest domestic disaster you have experienced? What's the biggest domestic disaster have you experienced? When I used to work in the insurance business, when we used to get some claims in, we used to get some bizarre claims in. I remember one of the most bizarre ones was that uh, somebody had gone away on holiday, and when they came back, their house had been trashed. And it hadn't been trashed by burglars, it had been trashed by squirrels. Yeah, some squirrels had got in their house and absolutely wrecked the place. And being insurance people, we asked the key question, what type, of quest, what type of squirrel was it? Was it a red squirrel or was it a grey squirrel? Because if you've checked your insurance policy, you will note that vermin, if they attack your house and if they cause some damage, that's not actually covered. But if it was a red squirrel, red squirrels are not classed as vermin and that's covered. So that shows how bizarre some domestic disasters can be. Is it dependent on the colour of the squirrel, whether my insurance will be paid? So you may also have a domestic disaster. I know uh, when I was living abroad, I'd been back here in the UK and I went back to my apartment overseas for work. And as I walked through the door, I got this really soggy feeling in my feet. I'd taken my shoes off and I stepped in and I stepped into a puddle as opposed to an apartment. Yes, a radiator had blown up in my house, in my apartment and flooded the whole apartment. So maybe you've had a domestic disaster. And at times, you look back and you laugh about it and say, oh, yeah, it was funny, yeah. But actually, when you were there, you feel very alone. I know as I had that soggy feeling in my socks and just looked around at my paddling pool for a flat, what was I going to do? I was living in a foreign country. I felt so alone. What to do? And at times, with COVID, with times, different pressures on us, the restrictions, we can feel, oh, so alone. But I want to encourage you today, you're not alone. And in particular, we're going to see this in terms of Jesus being involved in the ordinary, being involved even in those domestic disasters that just go on in everyday life. And we're going to see him in three ways. We're going to see him in provoking, in how he was poked into action as such. And secondly, we're going to see him how he pushed others so that they might see him. And thirdly, in what was produced, you will see God. So even in the midst of the ordinary thinking, does God care about the ordinary? Is God interested? He's the one who created the universe. Why would he be interested in my situation? These miracles that we're going to see over these coming weeks show that God is interested. God does care and wants to move in the very ordinary. So before we explore these three things in particular, uh, we're just going to look in particular just at the background, the context of that. And we're going to look in the Gospel of John. It's the fourth book in the second part of our Bibles called the New Testament. It's called a Gospel. It's about a testimony of Jesus. And John was one of the very best friends of Jesus. He was a fisherman. He lived locally to where Jesus lived. And Jesus connected with him and said, come and follow me. And so for three years, John was up close and one of 
the gang of followers who followed Jesus and he was one of the closest friends. And so after a few decades of reflection, John eventually writes this account about the life of Jesus. What was his purpose in writing this account? Well, it was fundamentally so that people could believe and trust that Jesus Christ was God and grow in that knowledge. This was the message John wanted to get across, that Jesus wasn't just some kind of miracle worker, wasn't some kind of teacher, wasn't some kind of prophet. He was actually God. And he wanted people to believe and trust in it. And he was a God who's full of light, full of love, full of life. And we're going to see these coming out as things get dark because of pressures, because of a disaster. We're going to see Jesus switching on the light. As things appear to be dead and ruined and broken, we'll see God bringing life in Jesus. And also we'll see, because he cares and intervenes, that he is the God of love, even in the midst of very ordinary things. And so as we're going to turn to John chapter 2 in particular, and the first two chapters of John 1 and 2 is all about how the pre-existent creator God came to become human and live amongst us for a period of 33 years. That's what Jesus did. And if you like, chapter 1's the prologue. It's the introduction to Jesus leaving heaven, being born here on earth just as we've celebrated at Christmas, living amongst us for 33 years. And in particular now, Jesus is round about the age of 30, and he's about to launch into this transition. Up until this point in time, despite the miraculous birth and one or two incidences, Jesus fundamentally is viewed as a carpenter's son, a builder's son. He's not viewed as God's son. But this is now going to be the start of the transition. Jesus has just been baptized. There's one or two people starting to follow him. And he says, If you're amazed at my insights, guess what? You're going to see even greater things in these coming days as my glory, as my godliness is revealed in these coming days. And of course, that's where we're going to jump in, in John chapter 2, to understand and appreciate more of the glory of Jesus being revealed as God. So, provoking. Do you have a provoker in your life? Sometimes people who provoke us can be good and bad, can't they? It can go either way. My dad was a provoker. Oh, it was usually in a bad way because he was always poking and prodding and winding people up for a laugh and a joke, which was funny at the time. Um, but at times, you know, we just said, Dad, will you just stop provoking us? But sometimes we need a bit of a prod and a bit of a poke to get us out of our comfort zone. And this is what occurred to Jesus in John chapter 2 circumstances and a person provoked him into action, if you like. And so let's just get a little bit of the background in John chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. Hopefully you can follow along through the PowerPoint slides. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. So it's just a wedding. Cana, nothing special about that. It was a nowhere place in the middle of nowhere. Nothing to any, any attributes as such a special place, not in any shape or form. And there's a wedding going on. We don't know who the bride is. We don't know who the groom is. We don't know anything about this setting, except it was three days after when Jesus had been spending time with the prophet John and been baptized and they moved down now to Cana in Galilee. And he had an invitation, his mum and his friends, the disciples. So it's as regular as that. It's a wedding. Perhaps you've been to weddings, certainly probably not in the last year so much, but in previous years, it's just a normal part of life. It's an exciting part of life. But it's here that we see this place of provocation in the ordinary. Verse 3 says, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replies in verse 4. My hour has not yet come. So here we see the provocation. There's a circumstance, the wine has run out. Now get all sorts of images of a Western wedding out of your mind here. Like in a Western wedding, you know, there may be some kind of service that goes on 40 minutes an hour, maybe in a church or something like that. Then you go for a reception meal, and maybe a bit of a disco at the end, and that's it really with most of our weddings here, certainly in the UK. But back in Cana at this time, weddings could last up to a week. They were many days long, and it wasn't just a personal invitation, the whole village, the whole town, the surrounding area would be invited. And 
the hospitality was huge. So you can imagine the wine running out would be a source of huge embarrassment, a source of shame. This family would never be able to get over it or live over it, you know, because it would just be constantly placed upon them. Oh, that was the family who couldn't provide for us at their wedding. And so there's this real need. There's this potential shame and embarrassment. And so that's the circumstance that provokes Jesus. But then his mum gives him a poke as well and says, Jesus, they've got no more wine. And then we start to see this little awkward conversation going on here. Jesus says, why do you involve me? And at one level, it's a strange ask, isn't it? Because at this point in time, who is Jesus? He's the carpenter's son. He's the builder's son. He's got a few of his mates. What on earth is he going to do to solve this wine crisis here? And if he is going to do something about it, is the time right? That's why he asks or makes this comment at the end, my hour has not yet come. Even if he is starting to reveal that he's not a carpenter's son, but actually he's a God's son, <clears throat> is the time right? Because once he starts to reveal this, everything's going to change. He's going to go public. It's going to become huge. There's going to be masses. There's going to be crowds. People's perspectives, people's insights, people's reactions to him. Some will love him. Some will hate him. Some will want to embrace him. Others will want to kill him. <clears throat> Everything was going to change. And so Jesus is right to make this point. Is the time right for me to reveal this? Because once I reveal myself, do you know what? Everything's going to change. And we'll only have a limited window to work in to see the glory of God revealed. So, thinking in terms of provocation, as you think about your needs today, as you look at 2021, as whatever situation you're facing, are you provoked enough to invite Jesus into that situation? Are you prepared to be a little bit like Mary and say, hey Jesus, I know you're the son of God. I know you can make a difference. I know you're the God of restoration. I know you're the God of miracles. Will you do something today? Will you do something right now in my situation, in my time of need, my time of embarrassment, my time of shame? Will you step in and intervene and do something? Have you had that kind of grown-up conversation with Jesus? Jesus had been out recruiting a few disciples, and yet the reality is probably the first disciple he ever had was his mum, Mary. She's already beginning to say, hey, I really know who my son is. And he is God. And I want to see him revealed even in this very ordinary situation. So whatever you're facing, it might be small. It might be insignificant to other people. But to you, it is an issue. Will you invite Jesus in? Will you say, Jesus, please come and move in this situation? We don't want to stay there, though. We also see this element of pushing that takes place in the ordinary. It's almost like this picture. Um, you've seen it sometimes with uh, birds and the mother bird with a nest. How do they encourage their youngsters to fly? Do they, give them a ma do they give them some kind of manual? Do they give them some kind of instructions, some kind of demonstration? No, for quite a few birds, the way they get their baby birds to fly is they push them out the nest, don't they? It's fly or die stuff, depending on where the nest is located. And so these youngsters either have to start flapping in order to fly, in order to live. And in a way, this is what we're going to see takes place here. That Jesus and the mother of Jesus, Mary, starts to push people in order that they can come alive and see God revealed in this situation. Have you got somebody in your life who pushes you? I've had a number of people over the many years who've pushed me. I think back to a guy called Graham. Not the Graham here at our church, but another Graham. There are always people who are pushy called Graham. You know these types of people. And when I was going to go off to Bible college, I had everything planned. I was ready to go off and do my theological studies, getting ready to go into full-time Christian work. And uh, I was going to give up work, worked out the funding and everything. And this guy Graham to me said, David, I know you've got everything worked out, but actually you need to go to this other place as well and add six months to your course. It will be life transformational. It will change everything. It will prepare you for ministry. And I remember kept saying to Graham, no, I'm not doing it. I've already got everything planned of when I should hand in my notice, how the money's going to work and all the rest of it. And he said, David, you need to do this. And I'm going to phone you every single week until you do it. I was like, what? 
And sure enough, he did. I don't know how many weeks he did it for, but it felt like seven, eight, nine weeks, something like that. He phoned me up every week. Have you filled in the form? Have you applied for this course? And in the end, you know what? I just did it. Even though it didn't make any financial sense at the time, I just did it just because this guy was getting on my nerves. He was just pushing, pushing, pushing. But I'm so glad he did. Because sure enough, that course was one of the best things I ever did. The people I met, they're still my friends today. The stuff I learned, I still use today. It was an incredible time of my life, and I'm so grateful that I had someone push me. And this is what takes place in these following verses here. Both Jesus, Jesus and his mum do some pushing, particularly of these ordinary people, the servants. Listen to verse 5 and 6. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. So straight away we see a sense of ordinariness here. There's the servants. Suddenly they're instructed by the mother of Jesus to do what he tells them. That must have been a weird thing. They're thinking, hold on, he's a builder. He's a carpenter. How is he going to make a difference in this situation? What's going on here? And then Jesus observes something there. He spots these massive stone water jars that we use for ceremonial washing. Yes, even before the times of COVID, people used to do hand washing, singing happy birthday, even back then. This idea every day, before every meal, before every situation, they would have to go through this process of hand washing. And Jesus spots the ordinary and starts to think, do you know what, I'm going to take that ordinary thing and start to do something extraordinary with it. It's just ordinary stone jars, and they're just going to be filled with water. Yet Jesus is going to do something extraordinary. There's this amazing picture that's going to take place here. That picture of ceremonial washing day after day following religious practice. And now Jesus is going to step in and say, there's a new order. There's a new beginning. There's a new person here. And he's called Jesus. And he's called God. And he's going to intervene in a situation in a way you've never seen before. That suddenly water becomes wine. And that's a picture, in a way, of what Jesus did on the cross that first Easter. That once for all sacrifice, instead of this day by day, religious process, trying to make ourselves clean, trying to make ourselves better, trying to make ourselves presentable to God, Jesus intervenes and says, look, I will sort this out. This is the picture here. This is the image here of just something very ordinary being used for something extraordinary. So is there something ordinary in your life where you could be pushed to be used on? For me, the thing that's always lying around in our house are not big water jars, it's footballs. Both me and my lads, we all love to play football. And I've been amazed how God loves to use an ordinary thing, such as a ball. It's just a bag of wind at the end of the day. And yet, when we're pushed into action, the way this can be used. I've been able to get into prisons and share the good news of Jesus because of this thing. I've been able to get into closed countries because of this thing. I've been able to impact people's lives because of this thing. Just by throwing it down before Jesus, letting Jesus take something ordinary and do something extraordinary with it, begins to show us that we can see Jesus. We're not alone and he can be trusted. So what is your ordinary thing in your life? What is that thing that God just wants to use in 2021. I'm so excited because of some of the potential I have through football to connect with people, young people in their lives and their families in this coming year once we're allowed to start playing football again. But what is that thing for you? Maybe it's baking. Maybe it's cooking. Maybe it's driving. Maybe it's a bank account. Maybe it's writing. Maybe it's tech. Maybe it's computer stuff. Maybe it's singing. Maybe it's worship. Maybe it's music. Maybe... You fill in the gap. But is there something ordinary where you could be pushed into obedience in order to do something extraordinary? Because this is what Jesus did with ordinary people and ordinary things, and he started to do something amazing. Listen to this in verses 7 and 8. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. I want you to put yourself in the sandals of these servants. This is a builder telling them to do something a bit daft and ridiculous here, isn't it? Go and fill those huge jars with water. 
Now, this wouldn't be something like driving along to a petrol station and just topping it up. That means going to the well, coming back, going to the well, coming back, going to the well, coming back. This would be a process that would take quite a bit of time because these jars are huge. There's six of them, gallons upon gallons, probably eight to a th 800 to 1,000 potential bowls of wine within these huge jars. So you can imagine the servants, what on earth are we doing here? And then the ultimate embarrassment, now you've done that, I want you to go and take it to the Master of Ceremonies. As if the Master of Ceremonies wants a cup of water at this point of time in the wedding. He wants wine. The party is still going on. Their jobs were on the line. Their sort of sense of self-worth on the line here. Yet, they did what Mary told them. They did what Jesus told them. They took outrageous steps of obedience. And as a result of that, they saw Jesus in the ordinary. Is God calling you to do some act of obedience in 2021? Is there something he's laying on your heart? Maybe it's something using something ordinary. But is he asking you to do something in 2021 that's risky, that goes public? When I graduated with my master's in theology, I remember this old professor, he just got up and said, yeah, wave your piece of paper around. You've got your certificate, well done in theology. And he said, it's meaningless unless you take a risk every single year for the rest of your life on Jesus Christ. That's the evidence of really grasping that Jesus is God, that we will take a chance on Jesus every single year in terms of obedience, in terms of going public, in terms of giving him the opportunity to work. So is God saying something to you today in 2021 that you should be doing? I hope so. We don't want to leave it there, though. We also want to see what is produced. The servants have taken a chance, but what was produced was amazing. So what has God produced in your life when you've taken that step of obedience? As you look back, has there been something that God has done? I've been quite excited in 2020, even though it's been a tough year. We had a course here, we ran together, there was probably eight, nine of us here at church, both from West Road site and the Wesley site. A gang of us got together and we called it the Arrow Course. And each month we used to meet and connect, we used to read and study the Bible, and just help each other to grow as disciples. And one of the areas I was challenged on in the summer was a whole area of giving, particularly we were looking at the care of the needy and the poor in our community. And I felt God really challenged me about my giving. I felt God challenged me, David, you've got to give more. You've got to give more. And so, in a way, that was my outrageous risk-taking thing I did last year. That was my step of obedience. So what was produced? I've got to be honest, I'm pretty excited. Because do you know what? Even though I gave more in 2020, probably gave more than I've ever given in my life, do you know what? I've got more money in my bank account at the end of 2020 than at the beginning of 2020. Isn't that outrageous? Isn't that God's upside down kingdom? When we take these outrageous steps of obedience, he somehow works and moves in might and power. It's not like I've got loads in my bank account, because I don't, but there is more in it at the end of last year than what there was at the beginning of last year, yet I'd given so much more. This is how God takes a pushing situation where we're pushed into obedience. He can produce something that is amazing and extraordinary. So let's not hold back. Let's look to share the goodness of God. Look what happens in verse 9 here of chapter 2. The master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. So it's this outside authentication, if you like. This guy who's clueless, he just thought it was another glass of wine. Look at his response in verse 10. Look at what he says here. He called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after. The guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. Wow, what outside authentication of the interaction of Jesus. When Jesus gets involved in things, even ordinary things, things get better. We need to grasp this. They get better in terms of quantity, the sheer provision through these massive water jars. They weren't going to run out again at this wedding. Not just in quantity, but in quality. When Jesus gets involved, the best emerges from life. 
Jesus brought the party back to life because of his intervention. This is what Jesus can do. This is what is produced. Do you believe that? Do you live like that? As we look at 2021, are you believing and anticipating that God is going to bring out the best in these circumstances, the best in this situation, the best in your life because you're including him in your life, even in the ordinary things, both in quantity and quality, Jesus produces. And it's this production that is recognized by the people. We see in verse 11. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So two outcomes here. As a result of this intervention, God the Son is being revealed. It's no longer the carpenter's son, no longer the builder's son, no longer the manual worker. It is now God's Son being revealed. God is being revealed. His glory, his power is being seen. That's great. But secondly, there's got to be a response here. Do you see the response of his followers? The disciples believed and trusted in him. Previously, Jesus had promised them, hang out with me. You guys are going to see greater things. He's already delivering on that. He's already saying, yes, I can do miracles. I can take the ordinary and do the extraordinary by my very presence with you. What a challenge today. What a challenge. And so what's going to be our call to action? What is God saying to you right now as a result of reading about this intervention of Jesus in the ordinary? What is God saying to you because Jesus is with us by his Holy Spirit? I've just picked out three things from my points. Maybe he's provoking you into calling on Jesus to act into your situation or a situation for somebody else, just saying, Jesus, I know you can heal. I know you can restore. I know you bring life and light and love. Will you do it now? And will you do it in this situation? Perhaps that's what God is saying to you. Or perhaps you're being pushed into some form of obedience, just taking an ordinary thing and start to do something extraordinary. As I was pushed last year, just taking something called money and starting to give away more of it, and God started to do something extraordinary, blessing others in a variety of situations and still blessing me as well. What is God pushing you on in that respect? And as God provides his abundance, will you share it? Will you share his productivity with others? Don't keep it to yourself. Give it away. And let's see God working more and more in the ordinary. And of course, there's others out here. They might need this message of hope. So do like, do share, do subscribe, do get the message out there because we want others to know they are not alone. They are not alone in these difficult circumstances. And so as we're just thinking about God taking the ordinary and doing something extraordinary, my thoughts turn to a time for communion. Got here some bread and some juice. Doesn't get any more ordinary than that, does it? And yet they are symbols, just ordinary symbols of the difference Jesus can make. I just remind you of some of the words we've just read in John 2, verse 6, verse 10, and verse 11. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kinds used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. We're reminded in this verse of the old ways. Let's try and clean ourselves up for God. And we realize it falls short. Doesn't matter how much hand washing we do. Doesn't matter how much self-cleansing we try to do. We need the intervention of Jesus. We need the new order. We need the water to be replaced by wine, which is the symbol of the blood of Jesus. For there is forgiveness of sins in his once-for-all sacrifice. And as was stated in verse 10 from that Master of Ceremonies, you have saved the best till now. Jesus, after this first miracle of water into wine, was going to do some amazing things. But when he died on that cross, he saved the best till now. That sacrifice didn't just impact one or two people. It basically gave an offer to the whole world. You can be saved, you can be rescued, you can be cleaned up, you can be restored in relationship back with God. And of course, the greatest miracle we've ever seen is Jesus came back to life three days later 
resurrection life. He's never died again. And we can enjoy that as well. Jesus has saved the best to last. And through this, on that cross, he revealed his glory. He revealed that he was God. And his disciples believed and trusted in him. So please do take these very ordinary symbols of bread and of wine or juice as they represent the body that was sacrificed for you and for me. And they represent the blood that was shed for you and for me. That sign of a new covenant, a new agreement with God, that washing, that cleansing. Let's take, let's eat, let's drink. Let's just do something ordinary, but be reminded of the extraordinary that God did by his present presence. Yes, Lord Jesus, through these symbols we're reminded the old has gone, the new has come. We're new creations in Jesus Christ. We have new life. We have light. We have love. We have your life within us because of your sacrifice, your substitutionary sacrifice. You dealt with our guilt, our sin, our shortcomings, our failures. You dealt with it all, our rebellion. You dealt with it all at the cross. You brought in this new order. You carried it all on that body that was broken. You shed your blood so that we could enter into this new covenant relationship, so that we can be forgiven and cleaned up and dealt with. Wow, Lord Jesus, I thank you for this extraordinary act that we just remember in ordinary ways. We thank you for your present presence with us because you're alive. You're not dead. You're alive. You've conquered the grave. And you're alive and with us here in 2021. Thank you for the power of your presence. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for bringing life to ordinary people such as us. We worship you. We praise you. Perhaps we can join in together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us. Give us forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the glory, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning and just remembering this coming week. Jesus is with you, even in the most ordinary things. Experience the power of his presence. God bless you.